Sharon Kelly from the Berwick Public Library. Thanks to the partnership with Berwick Community TV, we're able to bring programming right out to you because we can't have large groups gathering at the library. We have a great presenter here today to talk to you about modern dowsing. That's Glenn Johnson. Glenn was born and raised in York County. He's a lifelong resident of Maine, except for his time spent in the Army in the 1950s. He's worked at many jobs over the years, from farm chores to submarine electronics. Now that he's retired, dowsing is what Glenn does. Glenn is a regular patron and supporter of the Berwick Public Library and is much loved and known by all the staff and many of our regular patrons. Here to tell you more about this ancient practice of dowsing is Glenn Johnson, and he will show you how modern dowsing fits into modern day living. Okay, my name is Glendon Johnson. I prefer to be called Glenn, that's G-L-E-N with one N. I am going to speak today on various aspects of dowsing. Uh, I am a Maine native, started out as a country boy in a two-room school, moved to Kennebunk and when I was in the eighth grade and graduated from there. But I have lived in Maine, except for my time in the Army, I have lived in the state of Maine. My introduction to dowsing came after a Grange meeting, and we were gathered in a farmhouse in Wells having coffee. Uh, the subject of dowsing came up, talking about Henry Gross, who was written about by Kenneth Roberts. And I made the comment that I had lived in Maine so far all my life, and I had never seen anybody dows. And it turned out that the wife of, at the house was a, could dows. And so at 10 or 10.30 at night, we were out cutting wild cherry forks, and we uh, took flashlights out into the field and ran around behind the barn, and that's the time that I learned that I was a dowser. And uh, Kenneth Roberts wrote a book about Henry, uh, more than one book, but the one, the good one, that I would recommend as reading for somebody to understand the problems with the scientific world when you're a dowser. Uh, it was Henry Gross and His Divining Rod, that's the name of it. And Kenneth Roberts wrote uh, several books about Maine. Arundel is one of them, uh, Northwest Passage, and, uh, and others, which I, at this point, moment I can't remember. So the thing about dowsing was, and I mentioned the scientific world, science says that dowsing does not work. Well, the truth of the matter is that dowsing was being working before science ever became organized. So I'm not sure what right they have to say that dowsing doesn't work just because they can't fit us into their formulas. So I learned to douse before I was aware that I couldn't douse. <laughs> so as a little paradox. Now my work history runs from doing chores as I was growing up in the country to uh, working on submarine electronics at Kerry Navy Yard. 
And my education runs from a two-room school, the University of Maine, and Kittery Navy Yard Apprentice Program, which was a four-year course in electronics. Now, the aims here are to educate people on the truth of, about dowsing and two, to shoot down some popular ideas about dowsing. And as I mentioned, A, science says dowsing doesn't work. But it was working well before science came to be. And if you want to listen to well drillers, most of them, or a lot of them at least, will say that there is water anywhere you want to drill, and that's not true. There are places on this earth that you can drill at least a couple thousand feet and not hit any water. And that's a pretty expensive well for somebody in their backyard. The other thing, another thing about the drillers is that a lot of them will advertise as artesian well drillers. Now, there's a big difference between a drilled well and an artesian well. Artesian well, artesian, the word means bubbles out of the ground without a pump. So, a drilled well is a drilled well, and it may be artesian, but not unless the water comes right up out of the pipe without having a, pen, a, a pump in there. So I want to read something that I give a copy to my students when I give a class. And it goes like this. Do not believe in what you have heard. Do not believe in traditions because they have been handed down for many generations. Do not believe anything because it is rumored and spoken of by many. Do not believe merely because the written statements of some old sage are produced. I'm not an old sage. Do not believe in conjectures, conjectures. Do not believe in that as a truth to which you have become attached by habit. Do not believe merely on the authority of your teachers and elders. After observation and analysis, when it agrees with reason and is conducive to the good and benefit of one and all, then accept it and live up to it. That was written by Gautama Buddha nearly 3,000 years ago. And it's very true today. Now, There are many types of dowsing tools, and uh, they range from wood and metal and plastic to deviceless dowsing. I use mainly the metal L rods, which I will demonstrate later. However, for 35 years, I used the tool that I learned to douse with, which was a wild cherry fork. And there are beliefs out there that you need a certain, I'm gonna take my hat off. 
that you need a certain type of wood with which to douse. Many of your main farmers use an apple fork. But being open-minded and curious, I personally have doused with every kind of wood that I could lay my hands on. I have doused with oak, maple, uh, pine, fir, hemlock, alder. It does not make one bit of difference what the wood is. It will respond the same way. And there is another cliche out there that when it comes to dowsing, you either have it or you don't. Well, that is wrong. What you need for dowsing is an open mind and the faith to accept the fact that what you see done, you can do yourself. And that is the basic part. And I have a, a handout that I usually give out, which is called Dowsers and Believers Throughout History. There was Herodotus in the fifth century who spoke of divining rods. Marcellinus, a Roman author in the first century BC. There was Cicero, a believer, but back then they called it augury. There was Pliny the Elder who postulated that water flows in veins. Now try telling that to some of your educators. Seneca had the same belief and wrote about it. Aristotle believed in the new water sciences and Plato thought likewise. Then we came to the Dark Ages. And then when the Renaissance started, we had people who believed in dowsing like Leonardo da Vinci and Agricola who spoke of divining for ore in his De Re Metallica in the 1500s. Martin Luther wrote that he was favorably disposed toward divining. John Locke also mentioned divining. And King Louis, the, King Louis VIII gave royal support to mines and ores divining. So we enter the modern ages and we take our cause, dowsing believers as Albert Einstein, Rudolf Hess, David Ben-Gurion, Gamel Nasser, General George Patton, Arthur Kenneth Roberts, and a little-known translator of languages that completed the first English translation of Agricola's De Re Met Metallica. And that guy became a president was Herbert Hoover. And the secret to becoming a dowser is, as I said a little earlier, an open mind in faith. And the secret is between the ears and between the top of the head and the neck. It's what's in that head that is the deciding factor. The secret is in the mind. Now, there is another falsehood that floats around, and I have personally witness this one. I have been told in my face that I am not a Christian because I'm a dowser. Well, I don't hold to that. 
I think I'm probably a pretty good Christian. And in that vein, whatever happened to judge not lest ye be judged? I wonder what the feeling is of people when they do this. Anyway, there is a wide range of tasks that are involved with dowsing. It's not, uh, I didn't read the definition of dowsing, which is the best one that I have ever come up against. And I dropped my card. And I will read it now. Because if you will notice carefully, it does not mention water. Dowsing is the exercise of a human faculty which allows one to gain information in some manner beyond the power and scope of the standard human senses. And this was taken from a book called Morden Dowsing by Ray Willey. I give credit. I have this on the back of my cards I hand out. But I give credit where credit is due. Now, the range of tasks, which do include finding water, and first I'm going to read about levels of dowsing. First, level one is on-site dowsing, where the dowser would be directly over the target to receive a signal, which is a response from his or her dowsing tool. Level two, you are able to get dowsing responses while not being directly over the target. You are either within sight of it or able to walk to it easily for verification. Now, I do both. Level three, the target is not in view, but is over the horizon. It is not within your field of vision at the time of the dowsing. Map dowsing is a level three exercise. I do that also. Level four incorporates deviceless dowsing, where you shed all dowsing tools and go inside yourself and just know the answer. Uh, I don't normally practice this, but to me, this comes or covers what we normally do under the guise of um, of having some sort of insight, some feeling inside us that we respond to. Level five, advancing to this level, incorporates a huge change. One is no longer a passive receiver of information. A dowser at this level is able to channel energies for healing purposes as well as for other goals. I do not practice healing as a dowser. The ASD is structured in the state of Vermont. The state of Vermont state law is that if you practice medicine without a license, you are liable to be hauled into court. So I also belong to an outfit called ORI, or Ozark Research Institute, which is a healing group. So 
when I dabbled in healing, which I do, I do it as a member of ORI, not ASD or the American Society of Dowsers. The level six and level seven dowsers can replace lost tissue mentally through healings and accomplish other significant physical reversals by channeling energy. I do not claim to be a level six or level seven dowser. This is for those who think that they cannot douse and who believe it. Can you focus on that okay? I maintain that if a prairie dog can douse, anyone can. There are many facets to dowsing, many, many chores that tasks that can be accomplished. There is no limit to the use of dowsing. Uh, the limit comes with your hang-ups and your lack of imagination. That's the only thing that will determine what you absolutely maybe cannot do. Location of underground water veins has uh, the major, the priority with me, that's what I mainly do, is find underground water veins for people building houses or, or whatever. Oil, natural gas, minerals can be found by dowsing. It is all depends on the questions asked. A dowser can find buried objects, such as water lines, telephone lines, sewer pipes, graves, property lines, namakas, artifacts of all types. I worked for a, a company that did survey work, and my boss used to tell me, I do not want a report of you running around with your L rods locating the property markets. <laughs> and I said, okay, I won't do that, but it's faster. <laughs> uh, you can find lost objects, missing people, but you need to always ask if they want to be found because that's a key thing. Dowsing has been used to find missing planes, tools that have been misplaced, all personal kind of personal items, car keys, wallets, purses, glasses, whatever. It can be used for personal health and well-being. You can douse for the vitamins you need or even douse the meds the doctor gave to you and find out whether the dosage is what it should be. The universe knows. You can balance your chakras with the eye dowsing. You can do mental and physical self-healing. Communicate with your spirit guides and guardian angels. We all have them. They are there, and they wait for us to ask for their help. They do not force themselves on us. They use them in the location of detrimental energies and removing them by dowsing around the home or the workplace. Uh, a quick uh, example of that was when they built Noble High School they built it over a shallow, run, wide, running water. And when I first went over there and uh, to deal with adult ed, uh, I found out that they had to use um, 
various means of fans and other things to take care of the moisture in the carpets. And uh, so I went over there one day and I asked for the stream of water to be rerouted and I walked the path. I wanted it to be rerouted all the way around the building and that's where it flows today. Uh, it's a matter of ask and ye shall receive. And if, if somebody doesn't feel that I'm not a Christian, I believe in God and I use prayers to ask for what I want to have happen. So even, a, even somebody out in the woods in November, if they want to, can douse for where the deer may be from where they are. And it's very interesting that no matter where you are in the woods, if you forget your, your device to take you back to your car, you can take an L rod and say, what is the best and shortest way to go from here to my car and it will point. And if you follow that, it will take you by the, mo the safest direct route right to your car. That's difficult for people to believe, but I've done it. With police work, I learned the first time I opened my big fat mouth about finding somebody for the police. You are immediately number one on the suspect list if you provide any information at all. So I had to, uh, in my case, I said, well, if you want to be that way, why don't you check with my brother-in-law, who's a Maine State detective, or another friend who's the chief of police in Sanford. <laughs> I think they'll vouch for me. <laughs> so anyway, if you want to get into finding missing people, be very, very careful. You're in for a big surprise. So weather forecasting can be done on maps or just asking by dowsing what's going to happen. But you have to be very careful how you ask a question when you're dowsing. I'm going to give you a good example. You say, is it going to rain today? The answer is going to be yes, because somewhere in the world, it's going to rain. Guaranteed. But if you say, is it going to rain in Berwick today, Berwick, Maine, you're going to get either a definite yes or a definite no. So anyway, that's a list of some of the things, and it's limited only to the imagination of the dowser. Another thing that goes along with what I said about Noble High School, when a building is over a moving stream of water, it translates to probably to detrimental energy. And in the case of a school, it would reflect on the teachers, the staff, the, the students. And in conjunction with, with Curry lines, 
and Hotman lines and ley lines, which are energy lines that occur. The Curry lines are on a 45 degree angle. Hotman lines are north and south, uh, east and west. And ley lines can be most anywhere. But if they are combined, especially with a stream of water that is running underneath the, the building, they can have been documented to cause cancer and other very detrimental diseases. So that's another use that I have put for my dowsing is to de-energize these, these areas of toxification. I want to uh, touch on the use of thought forms, T-H-O-U-G-H-T and F-O-R-M-S, thought forms. Now, I use thought forms in my dowsing. And one of the main ways that I use that is if somebody has contaminated water coming into their house, I ask the universe to install in the line feeding the house a self-cleaning thought form filter to filter out whatever contaminant and all contaminants that may be entering their house through the water system. I have here a letter or a note. This uh, is a time that I worked on the south end of Parsons Beach. There's a huge edifice built there on the point. And the people, after 45 years, were tasting salt in the water. So I went down there, and I could not find where the salt was coming into their system. So I told them that my only idea was to put a thought form filter on the system and for them to completely flush every pipe in the house and after about three days, taste it. So it says, thank you again for working your amazing trade of dowsing on our property last Wednesday, or last week, at the big house in Maine. Our water appears to be salt free as you predicted. And here is the track check for Team Rubicon, whose volunteers are veterans working disaster relief. Best Katie and Michael. That's one of the few times that somebody actually gets back to me. I have them sign a contract and down at the end it says, please send comments, good or bad, I want to know. But few people do it. Now, let's get into the basics of dowsing. And here I will, I have pictures, which I don't know if you can, Ralph. Can you see that? That's the L rod, which is one of the tools. That is a baba, which is one of the tools. 
This is the Y rod. And this is the pendulum. Those are the four main tools that most dowsers work with. Any, maybe not all of them. So, this is my main tool. These are L rods. Okay. This is a wooden Y rod from Wild Cherry Fork. This is a plastic Y rod, which works equally well. And I will demonstrate them later outside. This is a special I made up because it's a very powerful Y rod made from the tips of two fishing rods. Cheap ones too. This is a barber. Friend of mine, Raymond Grace, uses a barber quite extensively. And this uh, answers questions from the universe. Now, something most people don't understand is that you don't have to you don't have to take pliers and mess up coat hangers. If you hold them at the balance, so they swing, you tip them up and hold them just tight enough so that they won't go up and down. And they work just like L rods. And I will demonstrate that. If they close, it's my yes. And if they spread, it's my no. So for the demonstration purposes, can you show me my yes? And show me my no. Now, there's no way that I can turn them. They turn freely. And the good thing about that is when you're done, you can go hang them back up in your closet and use them again. I come from a scientific background myself. And according to science, I shouldn't be able to douse. But since I learned before I knew that, I've been dowsing ever since, over 60 years, <laughs> so. This is a homemade Y rod. And just to demonstrate, I will ask it to show me my yes. Ah, hurts. Anyway, I will ask it questions. Is there a vein of water under this property? Yes. And I will turn slowly until I get the direction from where I'm standing. So it's out that way. Then I would then I would ask, how far is it from where I am standing? Is it within 50 feet? 
Yes. Is it within 25 feet? No. 30 feet? Yes. So you ask precise questions and you get precise answers. You ask ambiguous questions and you wind up in left field somewhere. I made, I made these special out of two tips of fishing rods. And I like to, uh, I have told my classes in the past that I put those eyeballs on the end so that if I ever got to be blind, I could still douse. My little weird sense of humor. Kind of had to hold it steady. My normal way when I work in the field is with L rods. But as you saw, I can work with something else. Now I would ask, with one L rod, I would ask, what is the direction to the, a, a doable vein? All right, and then I would ask, how far is it? And if you'll notice that I tip them down, and that is my my little give in to science. Just to prove science wrong, they have to go rise in order to move. They have to defy gravity. So, how, how far is it from where I'm standing to the, uh, to the vein? Five, 10, 15, how many feet? 20, 25, 30, roughly 30 feet. So then it's just a matter, and when I find the vein, for me, the rods will go like this, pointing along the vein. For some people, they go like this. For some people, they may go like this. For some people, they may cross. So there's no set thing. What happens for me is that's the signal. Okay, I'm standing over the vein. Okay. So at that point, I ask questions. I say, how deep is this vein? Is it within 100 feet of the ground surface? Yes. Is it within 75 feet? No. Is it within 80 feet? 85? 90? It's about 90 feet down. How much water is flowing in this vein? Normally, when I douse in the field for a single family house, it would be, I'd be looking for five gallons at least. So what is the flow here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, about eight gallons a minute. That's what I do for a client. So then for the client, I would say, of that eight gallons a minute, what is the recoverable amount that can be realized at this property. One, two, three, four, about four gallons a minute. Because which way is this flowing? 
It's flowing in this direction and probably feeds a little pond that's down there. But some of the water that is flowing here is already dedicated somewhere else. So you can't tap everything that's in the vein, usually. You might be able to, but usually that's the way of it. Now, one thing I did not cover, and that is the use of the pendulum, which is another tool. And I happen to carry my pendulum with me all the time. And if you, I can ask the same questions with a pendulum. Now, when I use a pendulum, I get it, I get it swinging. Because according to science, a body in motion is easier to trans, uh, to change that motion. If it's already in motion, it takes a lot less energy to change the motion than it does if you have to overcome inertia and start it from scratch. So, when I douse with a pendulum, I get it moving, and if it goes to the right, my right, that's a yes, because I've told it that's what I want. If it goes to the left, it's a no. So I could ask, am I standing over a vein? And it goes, yes. Is that vein within 100 feet of the ground? It goes, yes. Is it within 75 feet of the ground? And it goes, no. I, I can get the same results with the pendulum, but only on a windless day like today, because the pendulum it's very susceptible to the wind. <laughs> and my L rods are heavy enough so that it takes a pretty strong wind to really bother. I can tell you uh, uh, quick and dirty about my, my staked well in Godly, Texas, which was done over the phone uh, a lady came to a meeting and she was leaving for Texas the next day and she said, is there any way of knowing if there's wa a viable water source under my son's property in Texas? And I said, sure. As I said earlier, I got a big mouth. So anyway, I just got out my pendulum and I said, where is the property? Well, she didn't know the address. It was in Godley, Texas, which is southwest of Fort Worth. And we finally said, well, I said, you know your son's name? And she laughed and said, yes. And so we got the location of the property that way. And so I said, is there a viable water source under the property that in Godly, Texas, that belongs to so-and-so? And I got a, a good yes. So after she got in Texas, we, we still talked on the phone. And she ended up sending me a copy of the deed. I wait for the noise to die down. So she sent me a copy of the deed, which is 11 acres of land and a little two and a half by four <laughs> diagram. When I have a friend who's a graphic artist and has a, at a shop and she blew it up to a 
11 by 17 sheet of paper so that it was pretty good to work with. And I laid out on it, there were several veins that ran in different directions under that property. And I made a copy of it and I sent it to him. And we talked on the phone and he was somewhat familiar with L rods, enough to be comfortable in using them. So he was on his property in Godley, Texas. He had a cell phone in his pocket with uh, earbuds and a mic and L rods in his hands. And I sat on my couch in North Berwick and I had a phone in my left ear and my pendulum. And when he got to the spot, which was a crossing of two veins, and his L rods crossed, at that same instant, my pendulum went poop. And that was my, my first active long range dowsing but it wouldn't have made any difference if he was in Australia. It, and this is what science can't understand, how it can be instantaneous. But with the new advances in mathematics in the nuclear age, science is going to have to change their spots because it's already been proven that two related atoms far distant when you agitate one the other one moves and so distance is not the problem time is not the problem 